If you are visiting today, we are working through the Gospel of Matthew, and this is our fourth week actually on this uh, rather small section of text because of how many issues it raises and how many questions it raises for us that we want to try to answer uh, as biblically as we know how. Uh, it is on the topic of divorce and remarriage, and um, we are going to… My goal today is to try to get at least close to, if not at the end of that topic, and then in two weeks we will come back and deal with the issue of singleness and uh, some other topics related to that in verses 10 to 12. And I also want to apply some of what Jesus says to some cultural issues going on today that I think are relevant. That'll be, Lord willing, two weeks from today. But my goal is to get as close to the end on this topic as I can uh, today. So let me read the passage for us. It is, again, Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. This is the Word of the Lord. Now, when Jesus had finished these sayings, He went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed Him, and He healed them there. And Pharisees came up to Him and tested Him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that He who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. Let's bow our heads together. Heavenly Father, once again, I come with fear and trembling to this topic. Um, I just know, I know from conversations I've had um, with people in this room and perhaps people who might watch online that the, the grief and the the agony of going through a divorce, especially if someone uh, had a spouse who greatly and grievously sinned against them to justify that divorce. Uh, Lord, we know that the grief is absolutely immense. And uh, so, God, I pray for Your grace on those who've been through these things. I pray for uh, biblical uh, insight to know how to evaluate uh, what has happened to us or perhaps what we might be going through. And I pray, God, that You would help us to be biblical in our responses to these things that You would help us not to veer to the right or to the left, but to, to see the way that You have laid down in Your Word and to walk in it faithfully. We thank You, of course, for Your uh, great love for us. And Lord Jesus, we thank You for the way in which You are so faithful to us, uh, Your bride, the church, and the way in which You pursue us, and the way in which You died to purchase us for the Father. And thank You, uh, Christ, for the way in which You have loved us so well and continue to despite our uh, many failings. I pray right now, God, that you would be honored in this service, and I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the topic, to, uh, the, the, the points today are going to be just really, I'm trying to keep this simple. So, the points are simply, number one, Moses on divorce. Point number two, Jesus on divorce. Paul, point number three, Paul on divorce. I'm using that not in any way to imply as if these are not all inspired words of God. Everything Moses and Jesus and Paul say are the inspired words of God. I'm not saying Jesus is equal to Moses and Paul. They're just three great human beings. No, I'm not saying that. Jesus is, of course, the Almighty God and Creator of Moses and Paul. But for the sake of the outline, we're going to start in the Old Testament, Moses on divorce. Then we'll move back to this chapter, Jesus on divorce. And then we plan to get to 1 Corinthians 7, Paul on divorce. That's the uh, basic outline. And I want to leave our text for right now so you can hold your spot in our text, but turn with me all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 24, the fifth book of, of the Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 24. It really is somewhat strange, you might even be thinking, why have we not even addressed Deuteronomy 24, this entire sermon series? Well, this is the fourth sermon, and the whole controversy was about Deuteronomy 24, and we haven't even read it yet. So I did deliberately leave it. I didn't know it was going to be four weeks, but I left it for later uh, in order to, to touch on it a little bit later on. And I hope with all the other issues we've tried to put in place, I hope that this text will be more clear on what is happening. So let me read this. This is a long if-then Command. So, uh, before we get too confused here, let me just try to explain this before I read it. Uh, Deuteronomy 24, the first four verses, the first three verses are a bunch of ifs. I think there's like seven conditions. Like, 
if this happens, and if this happens, and if this happens, and if this happens, the verse 4 says, then you may not do X. Okay, so that's how it works. Verses 1 through 3, if this has happened, all these things, then verse 4 is the command. Verses 1 through 3 is not the command. Verse 4 is the command. Verses 1 through 3 is the condition in which the command applies. Okay, so let's read it here. Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4. This is the Mosaic law given to the people of Israel at Mount Sinai. Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes, because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, and she departs out of his house, and if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man dies who took her to be his wife, verse 4 is the command, then her former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. Now, let me just take a moment here, and I, I, it, it hit me today, not long before the service, that once again, there's just, there's just way too much to say that I can fit in this sermon, so I don't know what I'm going to do, but uh, just make it longer. I don't know. You're like, no, please don't. So, uh, we, we'll see. But, but he, here's, 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 I want to I make a, uh, I want to say something. So, Two years ago, I preached in Matthew 5 on a similar text, and I preached two sermons on divorce then. And there is something about this passage that I have changed my mind on since I preached two years ago. Now, you probably won't remember what I said two years ago at the end of a 50-minute sermon, but I do remember what I said, and it's kind of a big deal to me that I'm changing. I don't, this doesn't happen to me that frequently, so usually you study to, to teach something, and you come to what you hope are firm conclusions, and then you teach on it, and uh, occasionally two years go by, and you go, I, I'm not sure I got that point right. So you can, you can weigh this in your own mind, whether you think the me from two years ago is right, or the me from the day is right, or some other person is right. But I'll, I'll tell you what I said two years ago, sitting right here, and I'm going to tell you why I disagree with myself. So I'm going to debate myself at the end, if you want to stick around. I'm going to, uh, yeah, okay. So, who's going to win? I don't know. I'll probably, both of us will lose. I don't know what will happen. So, here, here's what I said two years ago. If you look at verse one again, let me reread this. Of Deuteronomy 24, 1, when a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found ESV, some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out. Okay, that, I'm just going to give you a little background here. That phrase, some indecency, literally in Hebrew is the nakedness of a thing. Erwat debar, the nakedness of a thing is the Hebrew. It's a very strange phrase. What exactly does it refer to? Well, it's actually used only one other, one other time in the entire Old Testament, and it's in the previous chapter where it says, uh, let me just read it here. This is very earthy language. I, you know, I'm not going to apologize. I almost said I'm going to apologize. I'm not going to apologize for the Bible, but I, this is very earthly, lang earthly language, okay? Look at verse 12 of Deuteronomy 24, 23. You shall have a place outside the camp, and you shall go out to it. You shall have a trowel with your tools. When you sit down outside, you shall dig a hole with it and turn back and cover up your excrement. Because the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and to give up your enemies before you, therefore your camp must be holy, so that he may not see anything indecent among you and turn away from you. Any erwat debar, any nakedness of a thing among you and turn away from you. So the only other time this phrase is used in the entire Bible, it refers to excrement, okay? So whatever this word means, and no one really knows for sure exactly what this word means, it means something really repulsive and, def and, and defiling and disgusting. That's, that's, we don't know exactly what it's referring to. What I said two years ago is I thought I knew what it referred to. And, what I, and a number of people take this view, and it could be right. What I said was, I thought Jesus in Matthew is defining what or what the bar means when he said, except for sexual immorality. So I said two years ago that Jesus defines something indecent as porneia, sexual immorality. That was, my, that was my take. That could be correct, but I have become persuaded that that's not correct, and there's a lot of people who take both sides. But let me just give credit here. Nathan Long, Philip Henry, Greg Rentz, in this room, and John Murray. He's not here. He's in heaven. Okay, John Murray uh, in his book on divorce, <laughs> and uh, so Don Carson and other people I've read, uh, a number of people, John Piper even uh, on this point. So, a number of people have helped me think through this, and, and I've actually changed my mind. 
And I don't want to throw you into confusion as I try to explain what I think this means. Um, so, the first thing to say is this. In this text, Moses is not commending divorce as a good thing. He's not. Moses is looking at a practice that already existed in Israel and the ancient world, and he's simply trying to restrain and curtail it. He's not giving the endorsement of saying, this is great, or, or God endorses or sanctions this particular act. But here's why I no longer think it's referring to sexual immorality or adultery. Here's why. And John Murray just, I couldn't escape the logic. It's so strong to me. In the Old Testament, if your spouse commits adultery, you don't divorce them. They are put to death. And this is crystal clear. Leviticus 20, verse 10. If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Deuteronomy 22, 22. If a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both of them shall die, the man who lay with the woman and the woman, so you shall purge the evil from among you. So Don Carson concludes, I don't know how to escape this logic. Whatever something indecent means in Deuteronomy 24, 1, it cannot easily be thought to refer to adultery which was, which, for which the prescribed punishment was death. Now, do you see that puts me in a difficult place? Because then what exactly is it referring to? And the term is not clearly defined. Let me give you another couple people. John Murray says this, it has to be admitted that the phrase, something indecent, is exceedingly difficult, if not precarious, to be certain as to what it really is. Great. One of the great theologians of the last hundred years says, I have no idea what it means exactly. Jay Adams, another so solid biblical commentator, quote, the idea of repulsiveness or repugnancy seems uppermost, but it's not clear. Raymond Brown, another commentator, says, it is not easy to know precisely what something indecent was intended to convey in the marriage context. Another commentator named Thompson says, the meaning of this noun is not clear. It cannot mean adultery, for this carried the death penalty. Okay, so what exactly is going on in this text? In this text, Moses is saying that if a man wants to divorce his wife for something indecent, whatever that means, he has to do a legal action. He has to write her a formal certificate of divorce and send her away with it. What's the purpose of this? You can only speculate. Probably it's to protect the woman in some way. Uh, she, would, she would almost certainly remarry, as, the, as, the, as, the, as this text will indicate. Uh, it, was, it was certainly to slow the man down in making a hasty decision. If the guy just goes into a crazy tangent and just decides to divorce his wife. He says, well, if, if I regret this, I can remarry her later. But this text says, if you divorce her, you have to write a certificate of divorce, send her away, and if she remarries, even if that husband dies, the two of them can never be remarried again. So this man has to know, if he, if he writes her this certificate, he may never be married to her ever again, especially if she were to remarry someone else. So let me quote here. This is the part where it's going to be, if this is new to you, join the club because it's new to me too in the last few months, but uh, I really have been persuaded of this position. Let me quote several people so you can hear it from them, not from me. So what, what is this text saying? It seems to be allowing divorce for a broader set of purposes than Jesus allowed divorce for. That's the, that's the troubling part, right? Jesus says, except for sexual morality, and Moses, it couldn't just be adultery because Moses must have some kind of broader thing in mind. Here, here's how John Murray says it, and I think this is correct. Quote, I'm going to quote several things, so just stick with me. It is highly necessary to distinguish between sufferance or toleration, like to suffer or allow or tolerate something to happen, on the one hand, and divine approval or sanction on the other. There is no evidence to show that this divorce, the, the kind in this text in Deuteronomy 24, was approved or morally legitimated. Permission, sufferance, Toleration was granted, but underlying this very notion is the idea of wrong. We do not properly speak of toleration or sufferance as granted or conceded in connection to what is intrinsically right or desirable. He continues, while divorce was suffered in the Mosaic economy, we have no warrant to suppose that under any circumstances was it sanctioned or approved as the intrinsic right or prerogative of the husband." Now, if you're not following that, Jay Adams gives a helpful illustration. This is decades old, but I'll come, sort of modernize it. He says, think about cigarette smoking in our day, in our culture. Cigarette smoking is not strictly forbidden, but it is heavily regulated 
Cigarettes can't be advertised in certain ways. They must carry the Surgeon General's warning. There's an age restriction for purchasing them. They cannot be smoked indoors in most places, etc. In this one respect, the practice of smoking resembles the way uh, divorce was viewed and regulated under Old Testament law. You see that? So, God is not saying, I love what's happening in Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. That a husband finds something indecent in his wife, writes her divorce, and sends away. God's not saying, I approve of that. It's simply being suffered or tolerated to happen within the Mosaic economy. John Murray continues, the penalty of a civil or ecclesiastical ostracism, that is punishment, was not attached to it. As we shall see later on, the, this freedom conceded or suffered under the Mosaic economy is removed under the gospel or the new covenant era. In other words, what was allowed without immediate civil punishment in the Mosaic law is no longer allowed without uh, condemnation from the Lord Christ Himself in the, in the gospel era. Let me quote the PCA position paper that I keep mentioning from 1992. They say this, divorce appears as an established custom in Deuteronomy 24, which is neither commanded nor condoned in the passage. We're not saying God approves of this. God is tolerating a practice and He's curtailing it, but He's not sanctioning or approving the kind of divorce practice in Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. Let me quote Don Carson. This is going to all sound very similar. This is clearly something quite different from sanctioning divorce, yet it concedes that divorce was practiced and even tolerated, yet toleration is neither divine approval nor divine sanction. It was tolerated because of men's hardness of heart. Let me quote one more here. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon. Quote, Moses tolerated and circumscribed, curtailed, an evil custom, which he knew that such a people would not relinquish after having been established among them for so long. They could not bear a higher law, and so he treated them as persons diseased with hardness of heart, hoping to lead them back to an older and better state of things by possible stages. Now, let me, let me apply this more broadly. I would argue, men, th th this is another big piece here. I would argue that polygamy in the Old Testament falls in a similar kind of territory, okay? So polygamy in the Old Testament was never approved by God. It was never sanctioned by God. God never said, I bless polygamy. Polygamy is a good thing. I love polygamy. That's never it. God gave us the blueprint in the Garden of Eden. And what was it? It was one man and one woman for life. It wasn't polygamy, right? That was not the original intention. And it certainly wasn't that Adam and Eve would, would separate and whatnot. So, but here's the point. God tolerated amongst the forefathers and in other well-known Old Testament believers. He tolerated, without sanctioning, a lot of polygamy. Can you think of examples in the Old Testament where polygamy happened without receiving immediate divine retribution? Yeah, lots of examples, whether it's Jacob with Rachel and Leah and others, and on and on, Abraham and Hagar and Sarah, and all these other things, David with his multiple of wives. But here's what we would say. Jay Adams says this, quote, God treated divorce in much the same way that he dealt with polygamy and concubinage, concubines, uh, recognition and regulation of these practices that, like divorce, were not from the beginning, show a similar approach. Now, when you look at polygamy in the Old Testament, is it always bad for the family? Yeah. First polygamist Lamech, Genesis 4, he's as murderous as Cain, brags about being like Cain, and takes multiple wives and boasts about how evil and vengeful he is. That's, the first, that's a bad sign. And then as you go through, every time you see polygamy, what happens? You have Hagar and Sarah hating and despising each other. Sarah jealous of Hagar, and on and on it goes. It brings strife. It brings division. It brings favoritism. It brings all kinds of awful and evil into the family. And guess what? First Kings 11, Solomon married, what, 700 wives, 300 concubines, and they led his heart away from a pure devotion to the Lord, and that led to the splitting of the kingdom into a northern and southern kingdom. It led to carnage and devastation. Is God telling us something through these narratives about his view of polygamy. Yes, he does not approve of it. He does not like it. It is a bad thing. But in the Old Testament, there was a kind of toleration or sufferance of these things that happened. Now, if Jesus were asked about polygamy, I think he would have answered the same way he was asked about divorce. Let me quote John Piper. When Jesus dealt with divorce and showed the Pharisees how the Pharisees were getting divorces when they should not, even though it was permitted in the Old Testament, he showed us in his response a way to understand why polygamy was also permitted and yet is now forbidden. Now, let me quote John Piper again. He says, so the reason Jesus did not any longer permit what had been permitted is because he chalked it up to the Old Testament to to in the Old Testament to toleration of the expressions of the hardness of the heart. Now, you can flip with me to Matthew 19, and I want to reread our text in light of what I've just said, and I want to see if it makes more sense because I, I think it does. So this is point number two. Jesus on divorce. We just covered Moses on divorce. Now, point number two, Jesus on divorce. Let's reread the text. I'll make comments as we go. 
Verse 3. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. He goes back to Genesis 1 and 2. They respond with Deuteronomy 24. Verse 7, They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? Isn't that clearly Deuteronomy 24 verse 1? Write a certificate of divorce and send away. And here's Jesus' response to that text. Jesus said to them, verse 8, because of your, notice He did not say because of our hardness of heart. Jesus distinguishes Himself from sinners. He's not in the same category. He doesn't have hardness of heart, thank you. Jesus is perfect, sinless. He says, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed, think, suffered, tolerated you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Now you'll notice here, verse 8, The way I explained this verse two years ago has changed a little bit. Look at this, verse 8. Jesus says, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. See, I thought what that was saying was, if your wife commits adultery because of her hardness of heart, the husband is free to divorce her. I think that's true. I don't think that's what verse 8 is saying. I think verse 8 is saying, the husband is divorcing his wife here. The, The Pharisees think divorcing their wives. I think here what it's saying is, They are using Deuteronomy 24.1, and they're saying, I find something indecent in her. I don't like her for some reason or another. Therefore, I'm going to write her a certificate of divorce. And Jesus says, that sufferance or toleration was because of your sinfulness. It wasn't because God was agreeing with it. It wasn't because God was sanctioning it. It wasn't because God liked it. It's because God was tolerating and curtailing it. He was not endorsing that kind of activity. It was not okay. It was not okay to just find something distasteful about your wife or whatever it may be and to send her away. That was because of human sinfulness. Same could be said for polygamy. And now Jesus is going to say something by divine authority. Verse 9 again, and I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So let me quote Don Carson again here. See if this makes sense. Jesus' judgments on the matter are therefore both lighter and heavier than the Mosaic Code. Jesus' judgment about divorce is both lighter and heavier than the Mosaic Code. What does that mean? Number one, it's lighter because does Jesus reduce the punishment, the consequence in this lifetime from capital punishment to the possibility of divorce? Yes, right? You see that? The punishment in the Old Testament, you commit adultery, you are put to death. In the New Covenant era, if you commit adultery, you can be lawfully divorced by your spouse. But is that a massive reduction in the punishment in this life? Yes. It goes from capital punishment to allowance for divorce. But in eternity, unrepentant adultery or any unrepentant sin will lead to hell. So in one sense, there's no reduction in the ultimate punishment for unrepentant sin. Second thing, Jesus made it heavier. How did he make it heavier than the Mosaic Code? Because he made sexual immorality the sole, the only, the single grounds for divorce, not something indecent, which was a broader category. You see, Jesus is no longer allowing the toleration that Moses allowed. He is now saying, no, in the New Covenant era, you are not... uh, Let me put it this way. Jesus is not so much, and, and Greg's helped me with this language, he's not so much changing the standard, he's going back to what? the original standard in the Garden of Eden. What he's saying is, in the Garden of Eden, there was never going to be this kind of stuff. And in the Garden of Eden, God had this, this way of looking at marriage. In, the Deutero- the, 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 in Deuteronomy, in the covenant there, God has a, a toleration that He allows, but then Jesus is now taking us back to God's original design in the Garden. And what's His answer? From the beginning, it was not so. From the beginning, it was not so. I'm going to skip some things. Let me move on here to point number three, Paul on divorce. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 
Let me read again um, the other really important text. It's probably actually the most disputed text on the topic. Let me read verse 15. This is about a believer married to an unbeliever. Um, let, me, let me start in verse uh, let me ver- start in verse 13. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever, if any woman who's a Christian, that is, who has a husband who's an unbeliever, and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children will be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Now, verse 15 is critical. But if the unbelieving partner separates, if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? So, just to, in simple terms, to restate, Jesus grants permission for divorce and remarriage in the case of adultery, especially unrepentant adultery. Secondly, Paul adds a caveat that Jesus did not mention because it was a context in which Jesus did not address. What about mixed marriages, a believer married to an unbeliever? Jesus did not get asked about that. He didn't deal with that immediately, but Paul is dealing with that in the city of Corinth where two non-Christians had, be- had heard the gospel. One of them becomes a Christian, and guess what? Sadly, one of them does not become a Christian. Now you have a mixed marriage, and no doubt the Christian was thinking, my goodness, I don't think it's right that I stay in the same home, sleep in the same bed, am intimate with an unbeliever. Uh, that doesn't seem right. It seems like the filing, and and I don't think I should stay here. I think I'm going to separate from my unbelieving spouse. And Paul says, don't do it. Don't initiate a divorce with an unbeliever just because they're an unbeliever. Don't do that. Stay married to them, love them, be faithful to them. And then what does he say? If they, the unbelieving husband or wife, wants out of the marriage, you do not have to fight tooth and nail to keep them married to you. If they are determined to leave and they are, they're, they're obstinate in that, and they want out, they want to go on and move on, especially perhaps because of your Christian faith, they want to leave the marriage, you are to let them go you're to let them go. You're not enslaved. And then it says, um, for how do you know, you know whether you would save that, that husband or spouse in the long run? You, you, you couldn't know that. You get the picture? The, the believer wants to cling to that marriage thinking, but I want to save this person. And Paul says, listen, if you fight to try to keep them in your life in a way that they don't want any part of, you're going to have no peace and it's not going to help. It's not, don't, don't try to cling to something if, they, if they're demanding to leave. And so Paul says to let them go, you are not enslaved. Now, this is a critical part of the argument. Do you see that word not enslaved in verse 15? Whatever your translation may say, it's toward the end of 15. If the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister, that is the Christian spouse, is not enslaved. Okay, I'm going to argue this is controversial. And I don't expect everyone, even in this room, probably to to agree with this, but I want to try to make a case. I'm going to argue that that not enslaved statement means not just that you're free to divorce that spouse, which I think is obvious, I think it includes freedom to remarry a believer. The reason I say that is because of the similar, it's not the same Greek word, I'll give credit, people make the other argument, it's not the same Greek word, but I think it's the same concept later in the same chapter, look with me down at verse 39. So you see there, if you're married, you're in a sense enslaved to your spouse, that doesn't mean it in a bad sense, but then it says once the spouse leaves, you're no longer enslaved, there's a freedom there. Look at verse 39. Similar language with different Greek words. A wife is bound. That's similar to enslaved, right? You see, a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. You see? So you're either bound to a spouse or you're free. And if you're free, uh, you are free to remarry upon the death of a spouse. Now, I think that language is a mirror image of the earlier verse 15. If the unbelieving spouse leaves, let it be so, you are not enslaved. I think not bound, not enslaved means you are free to marry whom you wish, but only in the Lord. Okay, not all Christians agree on that point, but I do think that's what that text means. Now, let me apply this now to some things I only hinted at last week. The, the, the first application is very obvious, what I just said. But unbelievers in your life, they're married to you. They are obstinate. They want nothing to do with your Christian faith. They want out, and they want out now, and they are leaving you. Are you free to allow them to, to, to go through with the divorce and to, and to move on? I think yes. The answer is yes. But let me get into the more difficult scenario I just mentioned last week, and let me try to spend a little more time on this. And let me tell you, I do not have all the answers to this stuff, not even close. I'm just going to give you some principles. I don't have all the answers to specific situations. 
I've heard scenarios that make you go, I would never have even thought that was possible in a marriage situation, stuff that is just crazy. So I'm not claiming to be able to dis- dissect every imaginable scenario, but let me give you what I think is a helpful concept that Christians, at least in the Reform- Reformation era till now, have, have had a lot of agreement on, not, not universal. Okay. We talked about abuse in the last Sunday's sermon. So if, if you're dealing with real domestic violence, if you're dealing with, it's often a husband who is threatening or even physically harming his wife or children or threatening to do direct bodily harm to wife and children, let me say what I said last week. The wife has every responsibility to get her children and to get out of that house. She is not called to submit to a man who is going to physically threaten and physically beat her or try to kill her. Obviously. I hope that is obvious. If a crime is being committed or has been committed, you can contact the police because the civil authorities, that is their jurisdiction. They can deal with that. From the, from the church side, from the ecclesiastical side, you want to t- contact your local elders and let them know immediately what is happening and the elders need to deal with the husband immediately and to talk through what might be happening there. Now, let me quote some old Christians. They've been in heaven a long time, okay? So let me just quote some people here on how they interpret our text. Here's the argument. The argument is, it's not explicit in the text, it's an inference. And inferences can be dangerous, but I I think it's, I'm convinced of the inference personally, and you can weigh it in your own mind. Here's the inference that we would make. We would say if a, let's just use a husband. If a husband is truly a threat to basic safety of his wife and kids, He's actually threatening them physically in some kind of real dangerous way. And this woman cannot live in the home with her husband without the fear of real, genuine assault and attack. It's not safe for her to be around her husband. If that happens, she needs to leave. And if if there's no way after months have gone by and perhaps even years have gone by and the church and the government have done whatever necessary to try to reconcile and make this man show genuine repentance, if there's no evidence of that and the man continues in his ways, this is the argument, Many good Christians, including the Puritans, have made this argument. If he is living in the home and he is truly physically dangerous to be around, then although he has not deserted you literally, like he hasn't left the home, he's in the home, he's forced the wife to desert him. And so he functions as a deserter, okay? And if this man's a professing Christian, he should be brought eventually to church discipline. And if he's unrepentant all the way through church discipline and he's excommunicated from a church, Jesus says you treat them as an unbeliever a Gentile or a tax collector, which means if you have prolonged, sustained, unrepentant, physical, domestic violence and abuse in the home, the husband is now acting like what? A non-Christian. And he is to ultimately be treated as an unbeliever. And if it's not safe for her to go back and live with him, you have functionally desertion by an unbeliever. Do you see the, do you see the argument? If she cannot live with him, he's forced her to desert him. Let me quote, I'm going to go back to the year 400 AD. John Chrysostom, okay, listen to this quote. He's, he's, he's expositing this text, 715. If day by day he, the husband, buffets or punches you and keeps up combatants, the literal word is war or fighting in Greek, he come, keeps up, he's fighting his wife, he's, he's, he's hitting her, punching her, it is better to separate. Okay, he said this in 400. For it is the other party, the husband, who furnishes the ground of separation. Uh, even as he did who commits sexual morality. So he's arguing here, if, if, that, if he's dangerous to be around, ultimately that could become grounds for desertion and grounds for divorce. Theodore Beza, he's the one who took John Calvin's place in Geneva, okay? This is from uh, 1500s. Listen to what Theodore Beza says, quote, to depart from someone, to, to desert, to depart from someone and to drive the other away by threats or force are the same thing. To desert someone or to force them to desert you by threats and force, it's the same thing. I agree. Puritan William Perkins, who was involved, uh, I believe, in the Westminster Confession of Faith in the 1640s, Perkins says, quote, for to depart from one and to drive one away by threat are equivalent. To depart from one and to drive one away by threat are equivalent. Puritan William Ames, same time period, quote, for if one party For if one party were to drive away the other with great fierceness and cruelty, there is cause of desertion, and he is to be reputed as the deserter. Okay? And I could quote more. I I will move on here. Now, let me give a huge warning about this, what I just said. I'm going to call this the potential of abuse of abuse. Okay? I think it's actually probably the bigger danger of the two. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying husbands are not, cannot be physically violent with their wives. That absolutely does happen, and that needs to be dealt with in the most serious imaginable way. I think today there is perhaps even a bigger threat of the word abuse being abused, to unlawfully justify a divorce, where there's not real abuse happening that would justify desertion and divorce. Do you understand what I'm saying? So let me, let me uh, quote here, um, and I'll, I'm going to keep this very anonymous. I'll just say 
This came from a real Christian counselor in a real Christian counseling session. That's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to say when, where, how. I'm just going to, this is a real document from a real Christian counselor counseling a troubled couple. Okay? I'm, this is word for word what this document said. This is the abuse of abuse. Okay? This is what you do not want to, to get from your Christian counselor. Quote, it's a questionnaire. If you, if you say yes to these three questions, it gives you a conclusion. It has a lot more than three questions, by the way, but I'm just going to give you three because these three are the worst. Here's what it says. Number one, do you find yourself trying to drive painful fear and anxiety underground with self-destructive addictions, alcoholism, shopping sprees, overeating, negative relationships, compulsive cleaning, or drugs? Okay, that's number one. Do you, do you, do you find yourself going on a shopping spree because you've got painful fear and anxiety going on in your life? Okay, number two, do you, have a, do you have a communication style with your husband of trying to appease or second-guess him? Do you have a communication style with your husband of trying to appease or second-guess him? Number three, do you withdraw from friends, relatives, and outside activities when your relationship with your husband is not working well? Do you withdraw from friends, relatives, and outside activities when your relationship is not working? If you mark yes to at least three of these, well, that's three of them, that's three of the 12 questions. If you mark yes to those three, you are suffering from abuse. That's the conclusion on the, on the questionnaire. You are suffering from abuse and should start examining what is happening in the relationship. Now, l- let me just say, that kind of stuff is toxic to a marriage. Because if you just said, okay, I went on a shopping spree because we're having a hard, like we had a, we had a rough couple days in our marriage, so I went on a shopping spree or whatever it might be. And number two, I've kind of withdrawn from my friends a little bit or I've kind of had this, these are kind of very minor signs. Okay, then for sure now that this is concluded on the Christian counseling questionnaire. Now, for sure, if you mark those three things, then you are suffering from abuse. Your, your husband's abusing you. Okay. Do you see how the word abuse can be abused? By well-meaning Christian counselors? Yeah. And what this could do is someone reads this and they could go, well, I think I'm being abused. And then they start going a downward spiral because they believe it. And suddenly they start rereading everything about their marriage and they start having the worst light on every conceivable interaction they've had with their spouse for the last 20 years or 15 years or five years. And they're rereading everything and they're saying, my spouse is abusive and I'm in this horrible relationship and I want out. And eventually it leads to what I would consider to be in this particular instance, unlawful divorce wrongfully on the grounds of what is not truly abuse. So this is why the Westminster Confession says people should not be making conclusions in their own cases. This is why you need objective people outside of you. And I, I want to say this with love. Uh, we we, 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 we want to we set up biblical counseling in our church, which is not identical to Christian counseling. You remember that uh, series that they did, uh, Josh Kraus and, and uh, Jerry and others did a while back. But we are all for sound biblical counseling. But at the end of the day, we are accountable to our own local church and to our own elders and uh, we, we've got to be very careful how some of this stuff is dealt with today. Does abuse, true abuse, really happen in marriages? Yes. And at times, are people calling things abuse that might not really qualify for actual abuse? Yes. And with the deceptiveness of our hearts, we need people who are objective, godly, and helpful, who can see from both sides, hear the whole story, and help us process and weigh what is going on uh, in front of us. All right, let, let, me, uh, let me start wrapping this up here. Let me just, uh, I'm, just, I'm, just I'm just cutting things out. Okay, for, I'm being merciful right now. I'm just cutting things out. We're going to get to the end of the sermon. If, if you have your Bible in 1 Corinthians here, uh, just look right back over to chapter 6. I want to read something I read last week, and then I want to move towards communion. Let me read a couple of passages here. 1 Corinthians 6, I want to read 9 to 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 11. And I'm sorry, I, 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 would, I think I would be admiss if I left this little piece out. Um, more could be said about this point. I just think it might relieve some pressure for some people who might be I don't know that I've only said this once, and I think it's a very important point, 
and I just, let me repeat it before I completely close this sermon here. Um, let me give a scenario. John Murray in his book goes through a bunch of scenarios. You know, X is married to Y, and then this happens, and what, you know, is this? So, I may go through some of those later, but let me just say this one scenario, because I think it's one of the most common ones. Okay. Let's say two professing Christians are married, husband and wife, professing Christians, members of a church. They seem faithful and godly, both of them, they're married together, okay? For the sake of the illustration, let's say that the husband commits adultery. And let's say that even when confronted, he continues down the path of adultery and remains unrepentant for a series of months or even years. A tragic and just awful and heart-wrenching situation. The church that he's a member of should walk through church discipline and should eventually excommunicate the husband. Can we all see that that is clear in this text? He should be treated as a Gentile or a tax collector, as an unbeliever, all right? Still love him. We still present the gospel, but he is now in, in that category. Um, we would argue that that wife is free to remarry. But let me make the situation more difficult, and this is where people get sometimes confused. Professing Christian and professing husband are married, okay? They're married. Let's say this happens. Let's say the husband divorces his wife without biblical grounds, okay? The, the husband who says he's a Christian divorces his wife without biblical grounds, but there has been no evidence of adultery. There's no physical abuse. There's nothing that would justify a divorce, okay? Everyone with me? The, the professing Christian husband divorces his wife without biblical grounds. Now, if the church is doing what they're called to do, should they put him through a process of church discipline? And if he refuses to stay faithful to his wife, should he be excommunicated for an unlawful divorce? Yes. Now, this is where it gets tricky. They've been unlawfully divorced, and they're separated now. At this moment, they both have to remain single, at this moment, okay? Because the, the, the divorce is not lawful. They both, even the faithful spouse who did not do anything wrong as far as the divorce is concerned, even that wife here in this scenario has to remain single for a period of time. But if that husband remarries before she does, the first time he's intimate with his new wife, right, when they get married, he, Jesus says, commits adultery against his previous spouse, right, because their divorce was not lawful. It was not biblically lawful. It may have been sanctioned by the state, because we have no-fault divorce, but it was not sanctioned by Jesus, right? So when they got an unlawful divorce, he's excommunicated. He eventually, let's say a year later, he remarries. Upon his remarriage, I, Don Carson, John Murray, many, many people make this argument better than I can, but I think this is exactly correct, and you need to hear this if this has been you in your scenario. Say you're the innocent spouse as far as it, I know we all sin, but innocent so far as the divorce goes. If your husband unlawfully divorced you and he remarries after a year, when he remarried, he, whether he realizes it or not, committed adultery against you, the wife, and we would say at that point, you now have freedom from that former marriage and you are now free to remarry because you have, uh, you have pornea there and you have divorce. I, I can explain in more detail why we believe that, but I want you to know that because a lot of people find themselves in that exact scenario, and they are haunted by guilt saying, wait a second, my husband left me for no good reason. A year later, he remarried. Three years later, I remarried. Was I an adulteress when I remarried way after he did? The answer is no, because he already committed adultery against you when he remarried his spouse. I know that may seem really technical, but that's a very common scenario, and People go through that. And you need to know, if your spouse did that before you, remarried before you, you are free from that marriage, and you are free to remarry. You did not do anything wrong if, if that was you in that scenario. All right, coming to the Lord's Supper here, whatever failure we have in our past of any kind, we can repent and be totally forgiven, as Paul said, such were some of you. 1 Corinthians 7, start in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when He was betrayed, took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, He took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it. Drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. If, let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are not walking in unrepentant sin, we would invite you to come forward and to partake of these elements that represent what Christ has done for us in His death and resurrection for His people. If you are not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we would not ask you to come forward. We'd ask you to refrain from these elements and to stay in your seat. What you need is not what these elements, uh, you don't need these elements themselves, you need what they re represent, which is Jesus and His finished work on the cross for us. So let's bow our heads together for a brief moment. I will pray, and then we will partake of the Lord's table. Heavenly Father, uh, 
help us as we think through this issue of divorce and remarriage. Uh, Give us clarity. I have no doubt that there are many more questions on people's minds uh, even after this sermon. So, Lord, uh, help us to be faithful to Your Word, uh, to think through what Your Word says, and to try to apply it uh, rightly to our own lives and to help counsel others who are going through uh, difficult circumstances such as these. God, for all of us who have sin in our past and and, uh, can feel the tug of sin even in our day-to-day life, Lord, help us to come uh, before the throne of grace for mercy and for fresh forgiveness. Lord, we may not be walking in deliberate and willful, unrepentant sin, but we know that we struggle with sin and that when we want to do what is right, evil lies close at hand. And so, God, I pray that You would help us to come forward with the freedom of forgiveness, that we would forget what's behind, press on toward what's ahead, and knowing that Christ Jesus has taken hold of us for this very purpose. So, God, be at work right now, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.